It's um, good to be with you this morning. We're going to be starting our new series today on the Holy Spirit. Now, normally we will have, in between two series, we'll have a disciples training uh, time. But, I mean, we just had that. Uh, the last series was, was pretty short. So we're going to forego that this time, and then uh, we should... And this series around the end of October, so we'll have our uh, next Disciplers training uh, class around that time, end of October, beginning of November. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to that. But uh, today we are looking at uh, and answering the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Now this series... We're going to be looking at uh, ten, 10 topics regarding the Holy Spirit. We're going to be addressing uh, this question, who is the Holy Spirit, and answering that question today. And then in the weeks to come, we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit and Jesus, the Holy Spirit and the believer, the Holy Spirit and the world, uh, regeneration and indwelling, so more specifically into his ministry and what, what he's actually accomplishing uh, regeneration and indwelling, and then our seal and pledge. We're going to be looking at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be looking at the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be looking at the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to be last finishing up with the Holy Spirit and the church. The Holy Spirit and the church. So some good topics, I hope. Um, and I know, you know, a, quite a few of us have a history in uh, Pentecostal or charismatic churches, uh, churches that have uh, uh, a uh, unhealthy view of the Holy Spirit. And so I, my goal is to help you uh, have clarity regarding this and for you to uh, more fully uh, enjoy and, and utilize, you, uh, you could say, utilize the work of the Holy Spirit in your life so that you're not looking for something that you shouldn't be looking for and so that you are looking for things in your life uh, and for works of the Holy Spirit in your life that you should be looking for. So that's my uh, heart and desire in this. Let me open up in a word of prayer and ask for the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, we come to you and Lord, we ask that you would uh, assist us this morning as we learn of the Holy Spirit. May we rightly understand who He is, what He is, His operation in our lives, His operation even within the Trinity. Lord, um, I pray that You would uh, guard us from uh, the errors that are all around us in places called the church, uh, that You would guard us from uh, overemphasizing him, but also guard us from underemphasizing uh, his wonderful work uh, in our lives and in the church. I pray that this would be honoring to the Holy Spirit, that he would be uh, rightly represented uh, by this, and that we, you would work in our hearts to appreciate him and to worship him and uh, to. Uh, relate rightly with him. We pray these things in Christ's name for his glory. Amen. Amen. So maybe if we could have a, uh, a theme verse to at least today, if not the whole series, it's John 14, 26. John 14, 26 where Christ is speaking to his disciples, he says, but the advocate, that is the paraclete, some, some translations have it, uh, the comforter, some the encourager. In the LSB, it's the advocate. I think that's closer to the uh, understanding of paraclete in Scripture. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. In this verse, we have so much instruction about the Holy Spirit. 
We, hear, we have here, of course, his name, the Holy Spirit. But we have uh, another name given to him, the Advocate, the Paraclete. We're going to be looking uh, in depth of how he is an advocate. How, what does that mean that he's a Paraclete uh, in the life of the, of the church and of the believer? Uh, we'll look at that in great depth in, in the weeks to come. But it's interesting, paraclete, it's uh, two Greek words, para and kaleo. And uh, kaleo means uh, to call. Uh, the church is called ecclesia. It's the ecclesia, right? Uh, and you can hear ecclesia, paraclete. There's some lettering in there that's similar. Ecclesia is the called out ones. That's what Biblically, what we are, we are the church is uh, those who are called out. That is a part called out from the world, called unto Christ and called unto God to be separate from the world. That's that's our identity as an ecclesia, as the church. Well, paraclete, parakaleo, that, that I, those those words means to call, but uh, to call alongside. And, and that's the Greek word para. Para means alongside or parallel, right? So that's, that's the, where we get our word parallel from, is this word, para. So to call alongside or to speak alongside is depending on how you understand that. Uh, is, is the Holy Spirit one called to our side or is he one that uh, comes alongside us and speaks to us? Well, um, as we're going to see in the weeks to come, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. That the Spirit is uh, uh, called to our assistance and summoned, as it were, to be alongside us. And he, that calling that is actually the sending of the Father, the sending of the Son. He sends the, he send, they send the Holy Spirit, to our side, and as he's at our side throughout our lives, he speaks to us. He, he uh, comforts us, encourages us. That's why you see this word advocate or paraclete translated comforter or encourager, because that's what he actually does uh, when he comes alongside us and speaks to us. So, a, a rich word. We have the Holy Spirit as his name, his advocacy, as his ministry in our lives. And notice also the Father sends him. So the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father. He proceeds from the Father. And he's sent in the name of Christ. So a large identity or a large mark of the ministry of the Spirit is that it is Christ-centered. He speaks and ministers in the name of Christ. And his specific ministry in the church is a ministry of teaching. He teaches the apostles here, the disciples, all things. And, and, but he does that in the life of every believer and in the church. He teaches us, maybe not all things on this side of heaven, but he does teach us all that we need to know because he's given us everything pertaining to life and godliness according to 1 Peter. So the Holy Spirit teaches us, and then not only does he teach us, but ongoing, as even as we don't have the Bible, carrying, we're not carrying the Bible around with us each and every day, and we don't remember everything that we read. I don't know about you, but, I, but when I read, I'm not remembering every single word that I read that morning. But uh, have no fear, the, the Holy Spirit is there to... Bring to remembrance what you learn, what, you, what he has taught you in the scriptures. And so he's a very active uh, participant in your life where he is helping you uh, through your day, remembering what you know in scripture and helping you apply that to scripture and uh, helping you along the way, comforting you, encouraging you, and using his word to spur you on to love and good deeds. So, so much in this verse, just in a cursory, you could say, kind of reading, not even getting into the depth of, of all this stuff. There's so much in this verse alone. 
But this morning, specifically, we want to look and answer the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, throughout church history, I always like to sometimes uh, introduce a topic this way. And throughout church history, there's been creeds and writings of the church as our church fathers have read Scripture and formulated doctrine from Scripture, trying to systematize it, trying to make sense of all of the breadth of Scripture and present it in such a way where it's understandable, learnable, and accessible to us. So this goes all the way back to the second century A.D. in the, you could say, the first creed of the church, arguably is the Apostles' Creed. And when it comes to the Holy Ghost or it comes to the Holy Spirit, that's all really you had is I believe in the Holy Ghost. And uh, there was not much more written about him. But as time went on and, and theology developed and uh, people uh, in the church weren't running for their lives, they actually had time to sit down eventually and formulate doctrine. That's why you see a lot of these creeds and councils happening uh, in around the mid-300s A.D. and after, because that's finally when things settled down a bit for the church as far as persecution. They weren't running for their lives as much anymore, and they could actually sit down and read and think and formulate. So the Nicene Creed in 325 A.D. says, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. The Westminster Confession, uh, you jump way later, the Westminster Confession of Faith says um, that uh, we believe, or I believe, in the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons, of one substance, power, and eternity, that is the Trinity, one God, right, uh, of substance, power, and eternity, one in essence, one in nature, and then three persons. Here, here we go. The, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, three members of the Trinity. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, and the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and Son. So you can see the, the relationship within the Godhead, within the Trinity. The, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all equally co-eternal, uh, ex- subsisting in the same essence of the nature of God. Their substance, their power, their eternity, all the same as God, but in three persons, God the Father who doesn't come or isn't begotten by anyone or anything. God is the eternal head, you could say. And then the Son is spoken in Scripture as the begotten one, right? And, I mean, John 3.16, His only begotten Son, for example. So, the Holy Spirit isn't spoken, though, as begotten of the Father or the Son, but rather proceeding. And we see that even in our, um, in our verse in John 14, 26. Remember, uh, the Father will send in my name. Uh, John uh, 14, 16, John 15, 26 also speak of the, Son, or the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. So that's, the, that's, that's how the Holy Spirit has been defined in church history. And we're going to, today, we're going to kind of take those creeds uh, apart and look at them piece by piece. So the first piece of, these, uh, of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit as is that the Holy Spirit is God. Number one on your notes. The Holy Spirit is God. And again, Westminster Confession states that there are three persons of one substance, one power, one eternal nature, 
And that's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All co-equal, all God. If the Father is God, if the Son is God, then the Holy Spirit is also God. And biblically, though, how do we prove that? Well, two aspects. The first aspect is we see that the Holy Spirit is God proven in Scripture based on divine attributes. Divine attributes. There are qualities or attributes that are ascribed to the Holy Spirit that are only ascribed to God in Scripture elsewhere. First one is holiness. Holiness. And this comes from John 14, 26, and other verses all over Scripture, of course. is in the very name. His, he is the Holy Spirit. And it's not, just a, um, it's not just a marker of that he's special. He's the set-apart spirit. That's not, that's not merely the meaning of Holy Spirit. It is... This is his nature. It describes what he is. He is holy. In his very essence, the Holy Spirit is holy. That's why he has the name holy. And who is given or uh, described as holy? God alone. Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Right? And that's the designation of the angels to God. And you have the same designation given in the very name of this person, this third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Also, secondly, I have one there for some reason, but secondly, uh, he is eternal. Eternal. This comes from verses like uh, John 14, 16. John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate that he may be with you forever. Can't do anything forever if you're not, if you're not there forever. So he is eternal according to this verse. Also in Hebrews 9, 14, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So here he is given the designation as the eternal spirit, not just the Holy Spirit, but the eternal spirit. He is, in essence, in nature, eternal, not only in his designation, but in his ministry to believers. Third, his omnipresence. We see that He is God based on his divine attributes. And the third being omnipresence. We got this from Psalm 139, verse 7 and 8. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. We usually quote this verse or think this verse just as in God in general, but, but we are to be more specific. He's speaking here of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. Now, God is Spirit, but specifically here, He doesn't say, where can I go from you? He says, where can I go from your Spirit? The Spirit of God. That's the Holy Spirit. So the psalmist asks, where can I go? Wherever I go, you're there, essentially. No matter where I go, God is there. The Holy Spirit is there. And so he is omnipresent. He is all present. He is present everywhere. Fourth, his omnipotence. His omnipotence. That is, he has all power. Omni is all, potence is, is where we get our word for potency, right? There's power to it. If, if uh, somebody is wearing a strong perfume, you would say, oh man, that's really potent, right? Uh, it's, so, so God is all 
powerful. Uh, and likewise, the Spirit is all powerful. We see this in His works. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So who can make man but God? You need an immense amount of power to make people and to give life. How can you give life if you are not the author and source of life? This is attributed to the Holy Spirit. Psalm 104.30, you send forth your spirit. They are created and you renew the face of the ground. Speaking of creation in general. So by the sending forth, and there you have that relationship again, the, proce- the procession, the proceeding, the sending forth of the Holy Spirit of God uh, from God the Father and the Son, and in that sending, that going forth of the Holy Spirit, there is creation. And so the Spirit, it was uh, part of, and working in harmony with the rest of the Trinity in the act of creation. We see great power there. Uh, Omniscience, the last attribute, the last uh, divine attribute that we see uh, attributed to the Holy Spirit. And there's more. I just picked out a handful here of of the many that there are in Scripture. Omniscience, we see this in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10 and 11. But to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. That is the things of God. The context is Paul is describing how How do we know the things of God, the wisdom of God, the teaching of God? And that is the them, the teaching, the wisdom, the things of God, or even the mind of God. And Paul says, but to us, that is to the authors of Scripture, God revealed them, the things of God, through the Spirit. And here's the grounds of that. Here's the grounds of inspiration for the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Searches all things, even the depths of God. And he draws a parallel between our spirit and the Holy Spirit. Who among men knows the depths of a man except the spirit of man with, which is in him? Even so, the depths of God no one knows except the spirit of God. That is the Holy Spirit. And so he says, think about it. You have a spirit, and your spirit knows everything about you, because that's you. So it is within the Godhead. How do we know the things of God? Well, where would we go? For the, for the thoughts of God, we would go to, his, to the spirit of God. And that is the Holy Spirit. And he says, that's exactly what happened when I wrote Scripture, is the Spirit of God, who knows all the depths of God and all the things of God, told us the things of God so that we might write them down. That's how inspiration happened. That's how we, we uh, received the, the Word of God. That's how it was written. But notice the depth of what is known. The Holy Spirit knows the depths of of God, who can know the depths of God but God? The depths of God are eternal, aren't they? They are infinite in nature. So it it takes therefore an infinite being, an eternal being, to know the infinite and eternal depths of God. He has to know. He he, he has to have omniscience. He has to know all things in order to know the eternal depths of God. How profound, how, how amazing that the Holy Spirit knows all things. Now, if that wasn't enough to convince you that the Holy Spirit is God, there, you can also see in Scripture His divine works. So there is first divine attributes, and then secondly, divine works. Among his divine works, first is his work of creation. We already talked about this a bit. Genesis 1-2. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the, depth, of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So there we see the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, present 
and active in the time of creation. And we see his function, as we saw before already in Psalm 104, verse 30, you send forth your spirit, they are created, that is the worlds and everything in it, and you renew the face of the ground. So there in the beginning in Genesis 1, we see and we we understand from passages like Colossians 1 that all things came into being by, by Christ, the second person of the Trinity as well. So we, what we understand is that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were all active members in the event, <clears throat> in the event of creation. And we're going to see later, if we can get there, uh, the economy of the, of the Trinity. The Father is the grand architect of, of creation. Christ, the accomplisher of creation. And then the Holy Spirit, the, consum- the, the one who consummates creation and actually gives it life. All three members of the Trinity involved in creation, and we see the Holy Spirit here in these passages. But we also see great miracles, miracles that are a proof of the deity of Christ are attributed to the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12, 28, Christ says, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Because, and he, what he's saying in the context is, uh, that well, he's answering the accusation, you're casting out demons because you're one of them, and you're working with them. You're working by the power of Beelzebub and, and by Satan. He's commissioned you at to, to trick us, and that's why you have power over the demons, because you're possessed by a demon, or you're working with demons. And, and Christ reasons with them and says, that just makes no sense. It's just foolish thinking. And he says, the reality is, if, if what I'm saying is true, and it is, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, my, not by the Spirit of, of, of Satan, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, and indeed it has, is the idea. And so the casting out of demons as proof of the deity of Christ, right? That's part of what he's doing in his, in his uh, ministry of his miracles. He's proving that he is God in flesh. Uh, it, it is also reflecting on the, uh, where the power is coming from as well. That even as a man, he's uh, depending on the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to cast out demons. And so it proves His deity as well, the the deity of the Holy Spirit. All right, third, and the last uh, divine work in which we see that the Holy Spirit is God is regeneration. This is one that hits close to home. I, I trust with you. Jesus, speaking with Nicodemus, he answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And he goes on, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. Now what Jesus is doing here is he's attributing the new birth to the work of the Holy Spirit. He is crediting our regeneration, the transition of every believer from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of life, the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from having a heart of stone to a heart of flesh, from being dead to alive, that transition of being born again, he's attributing it to the, Holy, to the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is, um, of course, the new covenant. Who promised the new covenant? God, right? God did. 
back in Jeremiah 23 and 33. Uh, he vowed to Israel, I will, I will wash you and I will give you a, a heart of flesh for your heart of stone and I will put my spirit within you. He vows that. He, he, he covenants that with his people Israel in the Old Testament. And this is accomplished by God himself. He, God promised it and God accomplishes it in the New Covenant. Specifically, the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is the one accomplishing regeneration. So, Christian, the, the, the reason why the, the, the reason why you saw Christ in his glory was because you were born again. The reason you believed on Christ was because you were given life. You don't believe and then grant are granted life. You can't believe if you have no life. And so you are given given life by the Holy Spirit, and that's why you believe. That's why you saw Christ in all his beauty and glory. And, 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 and what's helpful is, specifically, the Holy Spirit did that. He gave you life. He breathed life into your soul. He's the one that accomplished it in your, in your heart. Oh, so we should be thankful, shouldn't we? We should appreciate his work. Okay. Secondly, not only is the Holy Spirit God, He is a person. He is a person. Now we have, I can't, I, I can't count, and I can't count letters this morning. A, B, C, D, E, F, seven. Uh, I didn't finish my coffee yet. Uh, we have seven. Um, things that the Holy Spirit does that only people do. All right, and there's there are more, but I think seven. Uh, well, it's a number of perfection. No, um, just uh, seven is, is, is a good number, I think, uh, and we'll not go beyond that because it's just belaboring the point. But there, there's more. You could say um, not human things because that's how we think, but but. Uh, things of, that are markers of personhood. Okay, these are markers of personhood, not humanity, right? Because that we're bringing God down to our level. But this is personhood. This is what it means to be a person. Only people, persons do these things. First of all, he counsels. He counsels. Think of all the things involved in your mind. And your decision making and your relationship and, and, and all the, the, the things of what it means to be a person that are required to counsel somebody, well, the Holy Spirit counsels people. The spirit of Yahweh will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. So here is he, he is called the spirit of counsel. And he counsels with, with wisdom and understanding and knowledge and uh, what he's counseling is, is to produce the fear of, of God, fear of Yahweh. But he's called the spirit of counsel here. So only people, only a person can counsel. Not only this, but he teaches and reminds. And again, this goes back to our source verse, our uh, banner verse over this, over this uh, series. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Only a person can do that. Um, not only this, but he distributes. He distributes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. There is one and the same Spirit who works all these things. What's the work? Is he is distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Now, what's the context of uh, what is he distributing here in 1 Corinthians 12? Gifts. Good. So he's distributing among the church, among the, the, the believers. He distributes to each and every Christian 
a specific spiritual gift. So he distributes. And so if you don't like your spiritual gift, you can take it up with the Holy Spirit. Um, but he has distributed in all his wisdom, of course. Remember, he is all wise and all knowing. And so he knows exactly uh, how you can best serve the church. And he has gifted you specifically. And so what, what a wonderful thing uh, that he wisely does this in the church. Uh, next, he has joy. You might not think of this in, in regards to the Holy Spirit. He has joy. First Thessalonians uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.6. Can I get some water, please? Thank you, brother. Um, he has joy. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.6. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord. Thanks, brother. Uh, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now again, we don't think of it in this way, that, the whole, that this means that the Holy Spirit has joy. That's exactly what it's saying, though. It's not merely the joy that the Holy Spirit gives you. It is that. But you can't give what you don't have. And the Holy Spirit has joy. He has an emotional life because he's a person. And he gives us joy out of his joy. How amazing. On the flip side, though, he can be insulted. The Holy Spirit can even be insulted. You can't insult a thing or a force. You can't insult a robot. You can only insult a person. How much more, or excuse me, how much worse punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as a foul the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace. So, by trampling underfoot the Son of God, by demeaning, by your sin, by your unrepentant sin, specifically in the context, by being unrepentant in sin and abusing the grace of God, you are proving that you are not a child of God, he says here. And you are trampling underfoot Christ. You, you uh, regard as defiled uh, the blood of Christ. You don't view the blood of Christ as pure and holy and, and spotless. You disregard his blood and the covenant. And you insult the Holy Spirit. Because Why? Because his ministry and his identity is so wrapped up in the person and work of Christ, if you insult and, and revile the person and work of Christ, which is what he's talking about here in this verse, if you, if you revile and, and diminish the person and work of Christ, what he's saying is here is the Holy Spirit takes that personally. And, and he's insulted by that. Wow. But not only can he be insulted by somebody that is unrepentant in their sin, but he even can be grieved by us as believers. He, he is grieved. Isaiah 63, 10, they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, speaking of the Old Testament saints. So rebellion, the rebellion of the people of God, grieves the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says the same thing. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So when you sin, Christian, you, you are grieving a person. I mean, sure, we feel bad. We're grieved over our sin. But how much more, how much more perfectly and fully is the Holy Spirit grieved? So you feel bad about your sin, in a sense. You, you grieve over it. Someone else grieves even more so, eternally more so. And so it, it should make us, well, I don't want to do that to him, right? He gave me life. He ministers to me all through the day. He helps me understand the word. He, 
He, he walks with me and, and abides with me, the Holy Spirit does. I have a personal relationship with this one. I don't want to do that to him. I don't want to sin against him. I don't want him to make him feel grieved. Uh, and why? Well, because he loves me. He loves me. Romans 15.30, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So again, same thing as with the, as with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So the love of the Holy Spirit. This is not simply the love that the Spirit produces or encourages or, or generates among the believers, but this is the Holy Spirit's love for us, for Christ, uh, and it is the love that he then transfers to our hearts, to our souls. So the Holy Spirit loves. Now, he does all these things. Again, he, he counsels, he teaches, he reminds, he distributes, he has joy, he, is in, he can be insulted, he, he can be grieved, and he loves. Only a person can do those things. And so the Holy Spirit is not only God, but he's a person. That means then that he's not a force. He is not some energy, as some might describe him. He is not some energy force He's not the force of the Jedi. He's not uh, you know, a higher power. That's not the spirit. He is a person. He's powerful, and he exerts his force in, in his operation in the church, but that's not all that he is. He is the third person of the Trinity. Uh, those are the two main uh, teachings when it comes to the nature of the Holy Spirit. Before I go on to the last section here, any questions or thoughts regarding the fact that the Holy Spirit is God and the Holy Spirit is a person? All right. Okay. Yeah, um, so uh, in Proverbs, like Proverbs 8, probably referencing. So the question is, in, in Proverbs, is the Holy Spirit addressed there as wisdom? Uh, commentators are kind of all over the place, really, with that. Um, I would say that it fits best with the Holy Spirit, um, but uh, I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. Um, Proverbs 8 just personifies the wisdom of God and uh, speaks of the wisdom as uh, she, as a woman. And uh, we might, well, well, okay, is God a woman? No, that's not what it's saying. Uh, what's being done in Proverbs in, a, in personifying the wisdom of God as a woman is that you, you are then given in the beginning chapters of Proverbs the choice of following after or, or joining yourself with, because it's written to a young man, uh, joining yourself with one of two women. You have the promiscuous woman, right? In Proverbs, I think it's five and seven. And then you have the woman of wisdom in Proverbs 8. And then you have the epitome of the woman of wisdom in flesh in a godly woman in Proverbs 31. Uh, but you have those two options, basically, uh, in life. You follow after the promiscuous woman whose, whose path leads to Sheol, or you follow after the, the woman of wisdom, which is the wisdom of God into the path of life. And uh, that... Woman of wisdom, that personified wisdom in Proverbs eight, it says that he that she was there uh, in the beginning with God. Um, dance, it says even or rejoiced over, however you translate that, before God as He 
uh, utilize his wisdom to create all of creation. And um, some would say, well, that's actually Christ, because in the New Testament, Christ has become our wisdom and our sanctification and our and everything else, right? Uh, so the people say, well, he has become our wisdom in the New Testament. That means that he is wisdom. He is greater than Solomon, so he is all wisdom. And so that must be Christ. Um, some people will say, well, it's not, it, it says it has this uh, kind of mystical air to it in Proverbs 8. And uh, wisdom is attributed to the Spirit of God, uh, as we saw in Isaiah. And so the people attribute it to the Holy Spirit. And um, it's, it's, both options are viable, uh, but I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. I would say that you see in Proverbs 8, wisdom personified, and it's describing the relationship between wisdom and God uh, more specifically, the relationship between the wisdom in and of itself and God. And therefore, we see the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of Christ and the wisdom of the Father personified there in Proverbs 8. So a long-winded, to say, long-winded way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> um, good question, though. Um, so last, this morning... Uh, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit within the Trinity. The Holy Spirit in the Trinity. Now, the, the, the last of this, of the last, you know, um, subpoint, C in, this, in these notes, that's going to just uh, probably hurt our brains, and we're just going to stop there, all right? Um, but I want to build up to that with some foundational things. First of all, as we saw, uh, for example, in the catechisms and the creeds of the, that we started off with, that, um, again, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, in the Trinity there is a unity of the Godhead in three persons. There is one substance, power, and eternity. One eternal divine nature and three persons. One God, three persons. One in essence, three in personhood. So it's not a contradiction because it's one in one way and three in another way. Okay, we're not saying, you know, one plus one plus one equals one. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that God is one in essence, one in nature, and three in personhood. So, that means then that the Holy Spirit is a distinct member or person of the Trinity. Some have said that you, okay, it's clear in Scripture you have God the Father, you have God the Son, but the Holy Spirit is kind of like a force in between the two. It's not a person, it's the love of the Father and it's the fellowship and all the, you know, the feelings between Father and Son within the Godhead, and that's the Holy Spirit. Well, no, He's not that mystical feeling in between Father and Son, God the Father and God the Son, He's not the force or, or, the, or the, the, the life between the two. He is a distinct member of the Trinity. He is a distinct person of the Trinity. And we see this, for example, passages like Matthew 28, 19. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, here you have alluded to the, the Trinity and, and the, both aspects of the Trinity. So there's, it, it's one, God is, he is one in name. It doesn't say in the names of the Father 
And it doesn't say in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. There's one singular name. It's the name of God, you could say. Uh, and, so, and so though there are three names given, they all subsist under one name, the one, one reputation, one identity of God. And that is here you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, one in essence, three in person. All right? And uh, we see this in the promise of Christ. In the promise of Christ, we have all three members of the Trinity showing up here. In the promise of the Holy Spirit to his disciples, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, that he may be with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot see because it does not see him or know him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So he is a distinct member of the, of the Trinity because we see there is relationship and activity or action uh, done by different members of the Trinity, and those actions and activities are different. So you have the Father. Let's see if I can do this. The Father, and what does the Father do here in this in this in these verses? He gives, right? And then where where do we see? Uh, the, well, we see, let's first go with the, the son. So the, the son is, is the I. He's the one speaking. And what does the son do? He asks the father. And then we have, let's do blue for this one. Hopefully we can see it. We have the Holy Spirit, right? That's the advocate, the spirit of truth. And what is he doing here? What's an activity he's doing? Abides, yeah. So being in you and being with you forever. Yes. And abiding. So we have three different people doing three different things. All in harmony, but yet distinct. So we see even here, uh, the Holy Spirit is a distinct member of the Trinity. We'll see this distinction in, in the verses to follow, but um, next we see that he's not only distinct, but he also works in harmony. So within the Godhead, the Holy Spirit is distinct. He is a separate person, but he's not separate as in off doing his own thing. Everything that the Spirit does is in harmony with, the, with, with what the Father does and the Son does. Wherever we see the Holy Spirit operating, he is working in harmony with the other members of the Godhead. We see this, for example, in Matthew 3, verse 16 to 17. Can I have somebody please read that for us? Thank you. So, we see here, of course, Jesus is being baptized. So, he is the center of attention here. So, what's happening in Matthew 3 is uh, the author is presenting the Messiah to us and proving to us that we should listen to him, we should revere him, we should view him in a special way as God, as the object of our faith. All right? So that's what's being accomplished. And we see this, first of all, Jesus is submitting himself to being baptized. And as he comes up, immediately from the water, behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God. Now that's, of course, the Holy Spirit. And he's ascending on, he's ascending on 
the Son, he's descending on Christ like a dove coming upon him. And this is, of course, at the beginning of his ministry. So that we, what we're seeing here is the Holy Spirit, in a sense, and coming down as an anointing on Christ in a special way for his ministry, for his life of ministry for the next three years. That's all leading to and culminating in the crucifixion, his death, burial, and resurrection. So we see the Spirit of God doing this. We see uh, Christ being here, and we also see the Father, because there is a voice, right? The voice, that's the Father. Now, how do we know that this voice is the voice of God the Father, according to this verse? Yes. Yes. So, uh, who else says, this is my Son, but a Father, right? Right? And with, so we see this is obviously the God, the Father, speaking. And he's, he is, in a sense, pointing to Jesus and saying, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. It's, so you have the Holy Spirit, and you have Christ, and you have the Father. And what you're seeing here, in the baptism of Christ, in his, the inauguration of his ministry, you see the Holy Spirit and the Father working in harmony to set apart Christ for his work and to, as it were, spotlight Jesus. That's what's being done here. Um, we see the harmony of the Holy Spirit with the other members of the Godhead. Verses like uh, 2 Corinthians thirteen fourteen, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, that is God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Right, so you have all three members of the Trinity there, all operating in the life of the local church. So God in in all three persons from week to week is operating and working even in our church. And specifically the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is working. The love of God the Father is operating and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is working in our midst. Not only as the, this, this is the source of their work, the grace and the love and the fellowship, but also the product of their work. Christ is producing grace. The Father is producing love. The Holy Spirit is producing fellowship. So they're all working in harmony, even today in the life of the church. And uh, Ephesians, you have there on your notes Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14. So Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14 is one long sentence. And it's all about the blessings of God for the believer in Christ by the Spirit. And what we see is, generally speaking, in verses 3 to 6, we see the work of the Father, In verses 7 to 12, we see the work of the Son. And in verses 13 to 14, we see the work of the Spirit. So again, verses 3 to 6, we see the work of the Father. And that begins in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Who who is the one that blessed? It's the Father who blesses us. And who is the one that we should praise? It's the Father who, who should be praised or blessed for his blessings that he gives us. So that's verses 3 through 6 is focused on the Father's work in redemption. Verses 7 to 12, it, the general tone, the general attention shifts on the work of the Son. It says, in him, beginning in verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions according to the riches of his grace. And so, of course, it, it, the in him has always been pointing towards Christ. And it's, it's his blood. So it's the blood of Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God. And so verse 7 to 12 talks about the work of Christ in our redemption and salvation. And then it finishes off with specifically the work of the Holy Spirit. In him, that is in Christ, you also, after listening to the word of truth, the gospel of, of your salvation, having also believed... Here's the, here's the work of the Spirit. You were sealed in Him 
with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you are sealed in Christ. And what's the sealing? It is with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the Spirit is our seal. And it goes on, verse 14, who is given as a pledge. So the function of the sealing is to be a pledge. A pledge of what? Our inheritance unto the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So here we see the work of the Holy Spirit. One of his works in redemption is to seal us, to assure that we, um, that, that the pledge of our inheritance, the promise of the grace of God, the promise of eternal life that we have, communion with God in heaven, that that inheritance, that pledge is ours, it's promised, it's sure, and nothing can break that promise. And the Holy Spirit himself is the seal on that. So as we looked at, the Holy Spirit is God, right? So somebody would have to defeat God in order for you to lose your salvation. That's what it's saying. What a great promise. Now lastly, we're going to end with this. Just a few verses. Um, The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and Son. We've been talking about this, kind of scratching the surface. But we see in Scripture... The Holy Spirit is sent from both the Father and the Son. The technical doctrinal term for this is procession. Procession comes from the word proceeding. And they, they send, that is the God the Father and God the Son, send Him, the Holy Spirit, in order to apply God's redemption to us. Let me just read a few passages and say, say something and then we'll end. I will ask the Father, he will give you another advocate that he may be with you forever. So we see the Son initiating, as it were, in his asking of the Father. And we see the Father uh, as the one giving the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you and bring to your remembrance all that I said. So the, Adv- so the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father, but it's sent in the name of Christ. And then, lastly, John 15, 26, when the Advocate comes, notice, whom I will send to you, From the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So this is where we get the word procession, because um, this word for for proceeding is applied to the Holy Spirit in a way it's not applied to the Son. Just as in John 3.16, the only begotten of God, right? Uh, The begotten Son, that that word is not used for the Holy Spirit. So for the Holy Spirit, this is a good uh, way to think about him and his relationship in what's called the economy of the Trinity. So in the work of God, in the work of the Godhead, we see and in their relationship with one another, the Holy Spirit is the one coming from the Father. And even here, according to this verse as well, coming from the Son to us. So we can, and we're not going to talk much about the symbols and the imagery of the Holy Spirit. But this is why the Spirit is often called the breath of God. Because he comes from God as a breath. Your breath proceeds from you, right? That's why he's given that that designation, that imagery. So, what this procession means, and uh, I'm quoting from Petrus von Maastricht, a theologian uh, from the late 17th century. Just just good stuff. This guy is super good. Uh, If you can get your hands on uh, on his works... Petrus van Maastricht, uh, he's solid. Um, He says, 
For just as among the divine persons there is Father who outlined the work of redemption by eternal predestination, just as there is the Son who accomplished the same, which is the work of redemption, so also there is the Holy Spirit who applies the accomplished redemption and consummates the work by regeneration, sanctification, and so on, all his other ministries. So this is what uh, the doctrine of procession is talking about in the work of the Godhead. What we see is the Father outlines or plans or orchestrates or, or is the grand architect of redemption in all things. And specifically in the work of redemption, the Son is the one that comes and accomplishes the redemption. He's the one that died on the cross and was, was buried and rose again and paid for our sins and everything else, right? Right? He accomplished our redemption. Now the Holy Spirit is the one who applies the redemption. How does he do that? Well, he actually gives you life that the Son bought by his blood. He uh, he indwells you, which is the new covenant promise, which the Son purchased and ratified by his blood. And in and, and, and so many other ways, the Holy Spirit is the applier or the consummator, the, the, the finisher, the, the completer of the, of the work of redemption. So the Father plans, the, the Son accomplishes, and um, the Spirit applies. You can think of it as architect, um, uh, accomplisher, and applier. Three A's. Now, the last thing I'll leave you with is that's what we see in time, right? That's what we see uh, the Godhead uh, and their relationship with each other. We see that come out in their work, not only in creation, but in uh, the new creation of the heart, as it were, the, the, the new life, there are redemption. We see those three aspects of how they relate to each other, each other and how they each work. And, and we only see that because it happens in time, because Jesus came in time, and the Holy Spirit gives us life in time and, and things like that. But the, but, the, but, the, but the mind-blowing thing, the goosebumpy part of this is that that reflects back into eternity, that God the Father is eternally the grand designer. And the Son is, the, is eternally begotten of God. And the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. That goes back into all eternity, before time, outside of time. This is going back to their very essence, their, what they are, and the very relationship within the Godhead apart from creation. You have the Father as a source of all, in a sense, uh, unbegotten, not proceeding. You have the Son as the eternally begotten one. Right, He is of the Father, but never having a starting point because he's, co- he's co-eternal with God the Father. And you have the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, but never having a starting point, never having a genesis of his own, because he is eternally proceeding, as he's always been proceeding from the Father and the Son. That is the very relationship of the Holy Spirit to the rest of the, of the Trinity in eternity past. Now, that just... Blows my mind. It just blows my mind. And so the only response is we need to pray and just worship our God, right? Uh, just before we do, next week we're going to look at the Holy Spirit and Jesus. What was the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus, beginning from, remember, his, his uh, conception? It's a product of the Holy Spirit. Uh, on through his life and ministry, 
and even working in his death, burial, and resurrection. He was active there. And even now, uh, what's his relationship with Jesus Christ? And as we're going to see, his relationship is, I just want everybody to know the glories and excellencies of Christ. That's his relationship. And so it should be a wonderful time as we see these things next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for giving us just a, a window, just a glimpse into these amazing things, Lord. I, I trust that our hearts are stirred to worship. Uh, our, our brains cannot contain you. Our intellect cannot fully uh, describe you. Lord, no matter how many words we use or how, how many lessons we take or how many books we read, Lord, we, we are still just, we come to a point where we're just in awe. God, we pray uh, that you would help us to relate to the Holy Spirit um, in a right way, that we would appreciate all that he's doing each day. As we read the Bible, he is helping us to understand he, as we walk through the day, he's, he is uh, reminding us of what he taught us as we were reading. So, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your work. We ask that you would continue to work in our lives to help us to honor and to glorify uh, the Son. And uh, may we not grieve you, Spirit. May we not insult you um, by our sins, but may we respond to the love that you have and the joy that you have in Christ uh, by having that same love and joy as well. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.